Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Abby and this is Abby's Amateur Astronomy. Today we're going to continue our fun little constellation series and take a deep dive into the zodiacal constellation of Aries. I'm going to explain how to find Aries in the night sky. We're going to discuss all the stars that make up the constellation. And I'll even give a brief overview of the history and legends and myths that surround this ram in the sky. So let's get started. constellation is in the northern celestial hemisphere and it is one of the 12 zodiac constellations. This means the path the sun takes crosses the Aries region of the sky. So if you're in the northern hemisphere like me, it's best to see Aries in the autumn months and it is located between the Taurus and the Pisces constellations. But the best way to find this constellation is to first find the Pleiades. The Pleiades is in the eastern part of the sky, so when you're out stargazing, what you're going to do is just face east, and you're going to try to find a really bright star cluster. It's actually really easy to pick out. Again, a planisphere or one of those star tracking apps can be really helpful, but the Pleiades are really easy to see with your naked eye, so you should be able to find it. From there, we know the Pleiades are in the Taurus constellation, so Aries would then be up and slightly to the right. Now to me, the constellation looks just kind of like a curved line, but you know you found the right place when you spot there's three bright stars that are actually pretty easy to see with the naked eye, and then those three stars will make up the ram's head, so you know you're in the right spot. Now, let's take a closer look at the stars that make up the Aries constellation. The brightest star is called Hamal, also known as Alpha Aratus. It is an orange giant star with the classification of K23, located 66 light years away from Earth. This star marks the head of the celestial ring. It is estimated to have a radius that is 10 times greater than our sun's, and a luminosity that is 50 times greater. In ancient times, Hamal was associated with the vernal equinox, which marked the beginning of spring, but more on that later. The next brightest star in the Aries constellation sits just to the right of Hamal, and it's called Beta Aratus, or Sheraton. This star can also be seen easily with the naked eye because it has a magnitude of 2.7. This star sits roughly 59 light years away from Earth, and is an A5V classification, meaning it's relatively hot and it's gonna have a white or bluish appearance. Sheridan is a binary star system with its companion star located 26 astronomical units away. The third star that makes up the ram's head is Gamma Eretus, or Mizarthum, and it's located nearby Sheraton. The star is not as bright as the previous two, but with an apparent magnitude of 4.8, it's still visible. This is also a binary star system with an orbital period of 318 years. The primary star in this system is classified as a K03, making it a K-type giant star. The fourth and final star I'm going to talk about today is 41 Eretus, and this star sits at the other end of the constellation at the tail of the ram. This is actually a triple star system, with its A and B stars forming a close binary pair, and the C star orbiting at a distance. The apparent brightness of the A and B stars are 6.33 and 6.45 respectively, and together they have an orbital period of about 24.67 years. They are both A-type main sequence stars, which means they are relatively hot with a blue, whitish coloring. Um, this whole system sits a whopping 600 light years away from Earth. Now, let's explore a little further into the Aries constellation by talking about some deep space objects. I have three that I want to share with you today, and I promise each of them just keep getting more and more beautiful and spectacular. So let's take a look. Sitting about 100 million light years away, NGC 772 is an unbarred spiral galaxy that in these images looks absolutely breathtaking. Its asymmetric spiral arms originate directly from the galaxy's central nucleus, 
and it shows stunning variations in brightness and structure. Adding to the wonders of this galaxy is the fact that in many of these images you can see a bunch of bright spots. And these bright spots are actually star-forming regions that lie within the spiral arms. NGC 772 also falls into the category of a peculiar galaxy. Now, peculiar galaxies have the very scientific definition of just being kind of oddly shaped. So in the case of NG 772, if we look at a picture that's a little bit more zoomed out, we'll see that one of its spiral arms kind of extends past the others, which gives the galaxy this really um, almost oblong shape. Scientists believe that this is because of gravitational interactions with nearby smaller galaxies within the larger galaxy cluster. This galaxy is NGC 972. It is a spiral galaxy located 50 million light years away with an apparent magnitude of 12.1. So it may be dim to the naked eye, but through the eyes of the Hubble telescope, it is dazzling. The bright glowing regions of this galaxy come from the light of newly formed stars interacting with hydrogen gas. Because this galaxy has really high rates of star formation, it is often studied by astronomers to understand how galaxies evolve and change over time. NGC 1156 is an irregular dwarf galaxy that is relatively nearby at 25 million light years away and is fairly small with a diameter of 13,000 light years. Like the others we've talked about, this galaxy is also known for having many regions of star formation, um, but its galactic core is made up of older red stars. Officially classified as isolated, this galaxy remains uninfluenced by the gravitational pulls of nearby galaxies. However, there are some pockets of gas that are rotating in the opposite direction as everything else in this galaxy, which indicates that in its past, NGC 1156 probably had a close interaction with another galaxy. So like I mentioned earlier, Aries is one of the 12 zodiac constellations, which means its origins date back all the way to the Babylonian civilization, which could be as early as the second millennium BC. The Babylonians were known for dividing the ecliptic into 12 sections, so they could keep track of the passing of time and the different seasons throughout the year. Aries marked the last section of the year, so it was especially important mainly because it contained the vernal equinox, which to us is when the length of day is equal to the length of night, but to the Babylonians, it marked the beginning of the agricultural season. Today, the vernal equinox actually takes place more in the Pisces constellation, but that's just because of Earth's precession or its wobble, um, so that point just changed over time. In 1000 BC, the tablet that we call Mold Apen was created, and on it they marked the important constellations for that time. This is when we officially have record of the Aries constellation existing, but it was likely created and originated well before this tablet. To the early Babylonians, Aries did not yet represent a ram. It was actually represented by a farm laborer or agrarian. Again, this shows how closely tied Aries was with the growing season. It wasn't until the 7th century BCE that the symbol switched to becoming a ram, uh, for reasons that are yet to be known. To the ancient Egyptians, Aries is associated with the god Amun-Ra. This god is often depicted with the head of a ram in the body of a man, and represents fertility and creativity. Like with the other zodiac constellations, Aries made its way from the Babylonians to the Greek and Roman cultures. And in Greek mythology, Aries is the god of war. He was very powerful, he was really only second to Zeus, who was the god of sky and thunder. Aries earned his constellation by saving the twins Phrexus and Heli from their stepmother, Ino, who set up a very elaborate plan to kill them. Ino was really jealous of the twins, so what she did was created famine in their land and created a fake message from the Oracle of Delphi that told their father, the king, that he needed to sacrifice one of the twins in order to save the land. Now just as he was about to sacrifice Phrexus on top of a mountain, Hermes sent the golden ram to save them. 
Unfortunately, Hallie fell off Ares along the way and drowned and died, but Frexis was saved and brought to the lands of Cole Kiss, where he was able to have a wife and kids and live the rest of his life. Ares is one of the 48 constellations that was cataloged by Ptolemy in his book The Alchemist in the 2nd century. And from there, the IAU picked it up and made it one of its official constellations. When the International Astronomical Union, or IAU, was founded in 1919, it was meant to be the official scientific authority for the constellations and its boundaries. This is to help in star naming, and when you're referencing different locations in scientific papers, all those references can be uniform across the globe. Alright, so that's all I have for you today on the Aries constellation. If you're still here, thanks for watching to the end. I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm still new to this. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm kind of making it up as I go. So if you have any feedback, please let me know in the comments um, or any suggestions on what I should cover next. I still plan to continue doing constellations, but I think I want to try to dive more into objects themselves and maybe try to find some interesting stories I can convey. I don't know, I have a few ideas, we'll see what pops up. Again, any recommendations, suggestions, please let me know. And yeah, thanks for being here, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.